All right, welcome to class number 16, and this is our study in the Gospel of John, and welcome to the class. We're in the end of chapter 19 right now, and we found that when uh, Christ's uh, body was taken off the cross, uh, they took verse 40, and they uh, took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury so here we find that the Shroud of Turin could not be true. It was not a single burial cloth, but it was uh, these narrow linen strips. And uh, with the mixture of myrrh and aloes, uh, uh, this would have set up like concrete. And uh, for anybody to remove the body, uh, they'd have to be able to carry 340 pounds and, and move it out from wherever it was. And uh, it would be... Uh, a very difficult thing for uh, someone to do. And of course, if Christ did swoon in the grave uh, and somehow revived in the coolness of the tomb, as some speculate, then how would he get out of this contraption? He would be entrapped and he could not, could not get out. He'd be in like a big body cast uh, and it would have been impossible. Verse 41 uh, says, Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new sepulcher where never uh, man was yet laid. So this was uh, uh, the place where Christ was uh, buried. It was a cave that was carved out as a place for a burial. And it was uh, carved right out of the uh, uh, wall of the hill there, which is really on the side of where Calvary is. And when you're at the garden tomb, which is, I believe, the place uh, right next to the hill of Calvary, uh, you can look up above you to the hill of Calvary where Christ was crucified. And uh, there was a garden there. The evidence is there that there was a garden of a rich man. And uh, part of the evidence is, of course, in uh, uh, a wine press where the garden would have uh, uh, grapes and they would put them in the a press where they would step on with their feet and collect the uh, the juice, and uh, there was also uh, several large cisterns there. One was extremely large that uh, that uh, is still there to this very day. That evidenced uh, the uh, storage of water there and everything else that made it a garden. It's not a flower garden, but this would be a place where they would raise uh, grapes and uh, harvest them there. Verse 42, then they laid, um, there laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was near at hand. And that, that is really so true, because you have the hill of Calvary, and right there on the side of that hill is this tomb. So they didn't have to go far. So they took the body down, hurriedly prepared it, uh, and then they put it into the uh, tomb. Chapter 20, verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early. So now three days elapse, 72 hours. Christ was placed in the grave at sundown, and we believe he rose 72 hours later, which would have been a resurrection uh, actually at sundown, three days later, which would have been Saturday, sundown. And uh, uh, Christ, of course, uh, told us in Matthew twelve forty that you'd be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. <clears throat> three days and three nights is clearly seventy two hours. The daylight period is twelve, the night period is twelve, three day periods and three night periods are seventy two hours. And so Christ was in the grave seventy two hours and I believe rose at sundown on Saturday. Now again if you're counting by Jewish time, that would mean that the first day of the week begins right then. So Christ rose right at the beginning of the first day of the week, 72 hours after he's placed in the grave. When they come in the morning, nobody sees a resurrection. They discover the empty tomb. So I believe Christ was risen 12 hours by the time they discovered the empty tomb early in the morning. So Christ was already risen. Uh, every year at this church, we have a sundown service as opposed to a sunrise service because we believe that that's when he rose from the dead. So we don't have a sunrise service. Plus, 
the tradition of the sunrise service is pagan. It has to do with the counterfeit, which is uh, that of Baal and his mother Astaroth, or the short form Easter. <clears throat> and according to legend, Baal died or was mortally wounded and came back from the dead or survived after the 40 days of Lent, which is pagan, and has to do with this time of mourning and praying and fasting for his life. And when he comes back from the dead, they celebrated it by uh, watching the sun rise, which was a, a, a picture of uh, Baal, the also known as the sun god, uh, S-U-N, not S-O-N, and they would be watching that rise. I always wondered as a child, uh, why do we get up before the sun gets up, get all dressed up and head to the church, go outside and stand facing east watching for the sun to come up? And that's the reason why. Turn, if you will, back to Ezekiel. And here's just a quick reference to Baal worship, which is forbidden. God was very upset with Israel because of this. And I uh, uh, wish we had time to spend an hour here on this whole chapter because it's quite fascinating. But in Ezekiel chapter 8, I'll give you the page number as soon as I get there. Ezekiel chapter 8, <clears throat> we find here it says in verse 14, uh, well, let's look at verse 13. He said also unto me, Ezekiel, page 848. Page 848, Ezekiel 8, verse 13. He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. This is Ezekiel 8, now verse 14, page 848. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house. That's on the Temple Mount. That was the sanctuary. And it says here, uh, which was... Uh, toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Now that is Lent. Lent was uh, 40 days of fasting and weeping, and this was for Tammuz. Tammuz is the original name uh, of Semiramis's son, and as it traveled throughout the world, it became Astroth and Baal as it affected Israel. So this is Baal worship, and uh, the 40 days are the 40 days of fasting. There is no Lent in anybody's Bible. If you shake your Bible, Lent might fall out, L-I-N-T, but there is no Lent, L-E-N-T, in anybody's Bible. It's totally pagan. has nothing to do with Christianity. Then we find in verse 15, Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. Then verse 16, He brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord. Between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men, that's twenty-five men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord. So notice they're turning their backs on the Lord because His presence was made known in the temple and their faces were heading which way? Toward the east and they worshiped the sun toward the east. So here they are turning their back on the temple which is where God's presence was and they were facing the east, watching for the sun to rise. And that is, of course, at the end of the 40 days of Lent, they would watch for the sun to rise, a symbol or picture of the resurrection of Baal, the counterfeit of Christ. And so I believe that Sunday morning sunrise services are pagan in origin. People have been doing them for hundreds and hundreds of years, ever since Constantine declared the world to be Christian. And these pagan observances were wed back into Christianity. And so I don't participate. Now, I don't really enforce my views on everybody. I think most people are ignorant. Uh, a lot of people use the word Easter. I've been working hard for years to try to get people to drop the E word and use the R word because Easter is the name of Baal's mother. And the R word is resurrection. That's the word we ought to be using. And I always tell people that we uh, uh, celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And what I like to tell people is happy resurrection instead of happy Easter. And uh, it's uh, resurrection day, not Easter. And so uh, uh, hopefully we can have a dent in getting rid of some of the paganism in uh, Christianity. But in any case, 
Christ rose at sundown, not sunrise. The sunrise, uh, you know, most people think that's when he rose. They think he rose in the morning. And if you uh, interview uh, the average person, they'll say, for sure, that's when he rose from the dead. It was on Sunday morning. They're shocked when I say he came back from the dead on Saturday night. But it's easy to figure it out. If he's placed in the grave at sundown and was in the grave 72 hours, then he had to come out of the grave at sundown 72 hours later. And when you go by the Jewish timing, uh, that would mean right at the beginning of the first day of the week. Now what is interesting, this is the only way you can harmonize some of the passages. Some of the passages say that Christ would rise on the third day. And there are several other passages that say that he would rise after the third day. So is the Bible contradicting itself? I believe no. I believe the only way that can be resolved is if Christ rises exactly at the end of the third day and the beginning of the fourth day. And that way both can be true. So Christ actually rose, I believe, at that exact time. So I think what the Bible is doing is bringing us to an exact time when he rose. That he was placed in the grave at sundown and that he rose at the end of the third day but also the beginning of the fourth day which is exactly at uh, sundown on Saturday. That ends the Sabbath. If you are Jewish or if you've attended Jewish uh, services, they begin uh, with their uh, Friday night Sabbath at Friday sundown and it ends Saturday at sundown. If you're in Israel, most everything shuts down in Israel for the Sabbath, the national transportation system, the national television system, nearly everything. All the shops close and people just shut down for the Sabbath. But Saturday at sundown, Tel Aviv comes to life. The lights come on, the stores and restaurants open up and everything comes to life because the Sabbath has ended. You're really on Saturday night experiencing Sunday night. Sunday night comes before Sunday. And this is what happened here. So here they come while it's yet dark. So it's before sun up. And so this is the night period of Sunday, which occurs first. Just like in Genesis, the night period was first. The evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the second day. The evening and the morning were the third day, and so on. As the night period preceded the day period. So here it's yet dark. And they come to the sepulcher and they see the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom John loved, which is again John, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not whether they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple and came to the, the sepulcher, and they both ran together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter. John here is modest, but he's telling you he's faster as a runner than Peter is. Did you catch that? He beat Peter in a foot race to the sepulcher. They're both running. Peter's a little bit slower. John's pretty quick. And John beats him there to the sepulcher. So here's a foot race uh, in all of this uh, where we see John is a pretty quick runner. So we find here, Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple came to the sepulcher. They ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter. Was John bragging here a little bit subtly? I think he must have been telling us that. And came first to the sepulcher. So the first one there was John. Then cometh Peter, panting here. I'm adding that to the text here. But Peter is uh, following and a little bit slower. And then Peter, though, of course, goes right on in. And seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about the head, not laying or lying with the, uh, the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. So here we learn something else. Not only was the body wrapped in these narrow linen strips, but the head was covered with a separate cloth, a napkin that covered just the head. Now, the napkin had been removed and folded and put over to the side. What if it had not have been? They may have assumed that the body was still there. But now with the napkin removed that covered the head, they could probably look into this cocoon like affair where the body had been. Because he didn't cut his way out of this thing. 
and nobody hammered their way in or chiseled their way in. This thing set up like concrete. It was like a huge body cast. And so the body was gone. The head napkin was removed so they could see that the body was gone. And notice it was uh, uh, the napkin that was about the head was not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. <coughs> so I believe that Jesus himself must have done that. He took that part that was over his head and neatly folded it and set it aside so they would see that when they came. <coughs> then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher, that's John, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Not that they hadn't heard it preached, but it really hadn't dawned upon them what's going on here. They really weren't expecting uh, the resurrection and uh, hadn't dawned on them that he had come back from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Verse 11, But Mary stood without the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting, <clears throat> the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Now those that were with us on the trip uh, might well have imagined where those angels sat because there's a little protrusion right at the foot of the tomb and at the head of the tomb that uh, would allow for a slab to be laid over the top and cover <clears throat> the body. And apparently one angel was sitting at the foot of the tomb and the other one at the head of the tomb. And we probably were very close because we went actually inside there within a few inches or feet from where two angels had been. Interesting thought that we were actually there and actually uh, were where an angel had been. And of course, more importantly, where the body of Christ had laid. Then it says here, And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she thus said, she turned herself back, and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, Tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said unto her, Mary. And she turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, that is to say, Master. So notice here, although she didn't recognize him by sight, she recognized him by his voice. She had heard his voice many times, and when he spoke her name, she knew who it was. Now, they say, well, why didn't they recognize or why didn't she recognize Christ with her eyes? She'd been crying all this time. And she wasn't expecting to see him. And I would imagine her eyes were kind of clouded from all the crying. And she wasn't expecting to see him. And she thought whoever was standing there was probably the gardener. But when he spoke her name, uh, she knew clearly this was Christ. And uh, Jesus said unto her, Touch me not. For I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my Father, or my God, and your God. Now what is this all about? Because we have a lot of people say, why does he not allow her to touch him? Whereas later, we know he's inviting everybody to touch him and handle him, and uh, put their fingers in the nail prints, and all of those things. The answer is here, in the very verse. I am not yet ascended to my Father. What was Christ going to do and why would it be wrong if she had touched him? I think the answer is in Hebrews chapter 9. So hold your finger there in John and let's go to Hebrews chapter 9 and take a look. Hebrews chapter 9, look at verse 12. What was to take place and what I think John 20 verse 17 is talking about I think is here described this is page 1298 if you have the Schofield 
Hebrews chapter 9, page 1298. It says in verse 12, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in, notice, once. Hebrews 9, 12. Into the holy place, make note of that, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So Christ is going to take his blood into the holy place and present it there. And having done so, he would obtain for us eternal redemption. Now, where did he take it? It wasn't the temple there in Jerusalem. Because if we read verse 24 here, it says, Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. So he did not enter an earthly temple. It says, which are figures of the true, but Christ entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So Christ is saying he had not yet ascended to heaven. So what was he doing? I believe he was now going to take his blood up to heaven and apply it on the mercy seat uh, over the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies in heaven. The earthly temples were uh, figures of the true, but they weren't the real thing. And so Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So I believe that if Mary had touched him, perhaps she would have contaminated his sinless, incorruptible blood. And he was saying, don't touch me, because I've not yet ascended. So if she had touched him, perhaps she would have contaminated that blood. And so here he's taking his blood, every drop that he... Uh, spilt there at the cross I think he collected and took it up to heaven and there applied it in heaven notice verse 12 again neither by the blood of goats and calves but Jesus by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us so Christ is taking his own blood into the temple in heaven and that's what's taking place here I think in John 20 verse 17 Let's go back now and look at that verse again. Notice he says, Touch me not, verse 17 of John 20, for I am not yet, what? Ascended to my Father. So he hadn't gone to the Father with his blood as of yet, I believe. So he says here, Go to my brethren and say to them, I, what? Ascend to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Now, here's the man Jesus and notice, God is his Father as well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So Christ as a man is a Son begotten by the Father. And here he is going to go to his Father and your Father, my God and your God. So hopefully that clarifies there what's taking place. I believe this is uh, harmonizing the passage in Hebrews for us as to what happened. But uh, apparently Christ made several trips back and forth. We know that uh, he appeared for 40 days and then he ascends where, back to heaven where he is now, of course. But uh, when you think about that, uh, by conventional travel, uh, this would be absolutely impossible. If heaven is where Ephesians 4.10 tells us it is, beyond all the visible heavens, it's a long trip. They tell us today that the horizon of the universe is about four trillion light years away. That means traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, you'd have to travel for four, tri four trillion years at the speed of light to go one way to heaven. So if Christ were even to travel at the speed of light, which thus far no one has been able to get any object to go at that speed, uh, or to certainly travel at that speed, but if he did, Christ would still be on his way. 2,000 years is nothing compared to 4 trillion light years. And so Jesus would be barely, barely there. And then to try to say that he had to come back and appear later that same day, that's impossible. Unless uh, God is a multidimensional God and that there are like gates from one dimension to another and he can just step from time here to being there. And I believe that's what happens. So uh, we have a, a God here that's far greater than we. 
and can just travel right from here to there. And the same thing is going to be true for us. When we die, it says we're absent from the body, present with the Lord. Now, if the Lord is in heaven and we have to travel four trillion light years to get there, uh, it's not going to happen in the instant that the Bible implies there, absent from the body, present with the Lord. But I think because it's multidimensional, we go, we're there. It's just that quick that we're with the Lord. And I think that's what's happening here, that Christ makes numerous trips. And we see that throughout the Bible, where apparently uh, he can instantaneously be there and back. And angels are constantly going back and forth. And apparently there is no time delay at all. Fascinating stuff. But I think that uh, that's the kind of uh, God we have and the kind of Bible that we have. I always found it interesting that when you study the writings of the world religions, they always define their God or gods in terms of four dimensions. They are totally limited as to what they can do to the four dimensions that you and I are bound by. But the God of the Bible is not bound by those four dimensions. He's able to do things uh, that are greater than what we can do. And certainly, we could not explain any of these passages without believing that he is a multidimensional God. Uh, we used to have a book in our library now, uh, in our bookstore. We probably ought to order it again, uh, because uh, when people get curious about these things, you want to read about it. But there's a book by two physicists that uh, are both Nobel Prize winners. And they uh, describe that the God of the Bible, has to, they're Christians, has to operate in probably at least nine dimensions to accomplish the things that the Bible says that the God of the Bible can do. So if you like heavy reading and, and to get into understanding a little bit about dimensions, that would be a good book for you to uh, take a look at. We find here in verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Verse 19, Then the same day at evening. Now that's Sunday afternoon. The evening is the twilight period between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. So the evening now of the same day would be the uh, afternoon around 3 till 6 in the afternoon. Being the first day of the week, it's still the first day, so that's the daylight period. And uh, Christ had come back from the dead almost now 24 hours earlier, uh, had been seen early in the morning, or uh, the tomb was discovered empty early in the morning, and seen not too much later by Mary Magdalene. He had not yet ascended to heaven, but apparently now he goes. And now he comes back, and the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, that word means locked where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. So they, they were down behind locked doors because they were fearful of what uh, might happen to them. They thought maybe they were going to be taken by soldiers as uh, Christ was and also crucified. And it says here, uh, came Jesus and stood in the midst. So it doesn't say about the door being unlocked, him knocking at the door, or how he got into the room but it may have passed through the wall or through the door. And certainly Christ in his resurrection body could do that. So here Christ all of a sudden enters the room and it's locked. How did he get in? Well, I believe again uh, that in our resurrection bodies and the God of the Bible being a multidimensional God, that would be no problem. It says here, And saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And why? Because uh, this, I'm sure, frightened them. Uh, if you were in a locked room and all of a sudden uh, somebody uh, enters the room uh, uh, and didn't come through the door, you'd probably uh, get a little shook up yourself. So then it says here in uh, verse 20, And when he, had those said, uh, when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Look at the evidence uh, as Christ now shows them that he is indeed the one that had been crucified that was now back from the dead. He showed them what? His hands and he showed them his side. His hands that had been pierced by the spikes that nailed him to the cross and his side where the soldier's spear had uh, been thrust up into his chest cavity 
And uh, uh, they obviously now were glad and rejoiced uh, when they saw uh, the Lord. This is very, very good and very important because Islam, for example, attacks the death, burial, and resurrection story. And Islam says that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. The Koran says that Jesus Christ was not crucified. The Koran says Jesus Christ was not buried. And the Koran says that Jesus Christ did not rise again from the dead. Now, <clears throat> if you deny all that, what chance of, is there of you getting saved? Because the gospel is centered around the death of Christ, his shed blood as a payment for our sins, and the fact that he was buried and rose again from the dead. So this is a big obstacle when you're witnessing to somebody of the Islamic faith. You've got to go right back at the gospel and tell them that he was crucified. Here's what they say. They say that somebody who looked like Jesus was crucified. That Jesus was out of town on the occasion of the crucifixion. And he, when he came back to town three days later, they saw him and mistakenly thought he had been raised from the dead. So that is the Islamic lie. I can't tell you how many times I've had a, a Muslim tell me that lie. But they believe the lie of the devil. And, you know, that's the only religion that actually takes on the heartbeat of Christianity and rejects it. I don't know of another one that does that. But Islam directly attacks the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. Now, notice here, the Bible, of course, uh, refutes that because it tells us that when he came back, he wasn't somebody who looked like Jesus, but when he came back, he showed them that he was the same one that was crucified because it says here he showed them his hands and his side. So this is uh, clear that it's not somebody who looked like Jesus, but this is the same one that was crucified that had come back from the dead. And we have lots of scripture to support that. So these are verses that you need to know to be able to talk to somebody of the Islamic faith. Uh, I don't believe you're going to be too successful in in winning all these people to Christ. But you can win some. And uh, it's obviously uh, something we ought to attempt to do. We need to pray for them that they would see the light and understand the truth and realize that Christ uh, did come back from the dead. Turn, if you will, to Acts chapter 2. And I love how the Bible helps us here connect the dots. And this is especially good when you're talking to those that deny the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection, we're not going to go through his whole message, but I want you to go to page 1151, and let's look at verse 36. And here it says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly. I love this verse. It really is a favorite of mine. Therefore, verse 36 of Acts chapter 2. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus. Now, I like to mark the phrase, that same Jesus. What Jesus is Peter talking about? Well, the next phrase says, we're talking here about the one whom you have crucified. All right. So here we're having Peter tell us that the one that was crucified is the one that was buried, is the one that was resurrected from the dead, and is the one that ascended back to heaven. And I like that phrase. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus. Which one? The one whom you have crucified, Acts 2.36. Both Lord, which means he's God, and Christ, which means he's the Messiah. So Jesus is both God and he is the Messiah. And he's the one that came back from the dead. He's the very one that had been crucified, the very one who had been buried, and the same one that came back from the dead. Now, 
If you go over to chapter 1 of Acts, here we have two angels standing by when Christ ascends to heaven at the end of 40 days, after Christ had come back from the dead and showed himself alive for 40 days. We find here, he gave the Great Commission in verse 8. Acts 1-9, page 1148, we find it says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, verse 9 of chapter 1 of Acts, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, you men of Galilee, these are two angels, why stand you gazing up into heaven? Here's that phrase again, if you're marking it in your Bible. This same Jesus, this same Jesus, and look at what it says this, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in man like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. So here it tells us, that the Jesus that was crucified is the Jesus that was buried, is the Jesus that rose from the dead, is the Jesus that ascends to heaven, and is the same Jesus that will come again at the second coming. So will we have a, a different Jesus come at the second coming? No. It's the same Jesus throughout. The Bible is very good here to connect all the dots. And of course Christ coming back in the same body helps us uh, to uh, actually have the evidence to prove that it's the same one. Not somebody who looked like Christ. But this is the one that was crucified, who was buried, who was resurrected, who ascended. And then it says here, when he ascends, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, you've watched him now return uh, physically, bodily, up into heaven, shall so come in like manner, that is physically, bodily, Back as you've seen him go into heaven, he'll come back in the same way. That's the second coming, not the rapture. But when Christ comes back at the second coming, he'll be visibly seen. As he was visibly seen leaving, he'll be visibly seen coming back. And he was uh, in his physical body. And uh, he comes back in that same physical body that he was crucified in. And we find that uh, apparently people will see it. You know, when we read Revelation 1-7, which is the book of Revelation in the minister, it says, every eye shall see him. At the second coming, people all over the earth will see Jesus coming. And here you'll notice they're watching him as he left. So in the same way that he left, so will he come again at the second coming. And the Bible here tells us it's the very same uh, Jesus that we're talking about here. So I think this is a great passage. And if you haven't done much thought about all of this, it's important to know that uh, Christ did come back in that same body, did have the wounds in his body that confirmed the fact that it wasn't somebody else. This wasn't a switch, you know. It wasn't a bait and switch. It wasn't a, a switch on somebody's part to uh, try to fool people. Uh, it was the same Jesus that uh, came back. Now, let's go back to John 20. And we find here in verse 21, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And I love this one because it tells us the reason for which we have been sent. If you remember, in the real Lord's Prayer, in John chapter 17, let's turn over there, Let's look at verse 18. Rennie, could you turn the air off? You know how to do that one little stick from cool to off. Hanging on the bottom on the left. The left, the left one. No, don't open anything up. Just it's hanging down. One notch to the left. There you go. Excellent. John 17, verse 18, it says, As thou hast sent me into the world... Even so have I also sent them into the world. We commented on this before, but it is Christ saying, 
we're sent with the same purpose that he was sent with. Now, what does the Bible say about why Christ was sent? I'll quote a couple of verses. In John 3.17, it says, God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So we know the reason why Christ came was for salvation. Uh, we know in 1 Timothy 1.15, it says, This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's the reason why he came. So Christ is telling us, as the Father has sent me into the world, even so have I also sent you into the world. So we have the same purpose, that's to win the lost, uh, to bring people to a saving knowledge of Christ. And he says that here in chapter 17, uh, basically his final words before he goes to the cross. Then we find Jesus now in chapter 20, Having, having experienced the cross, having been buried, now being raised from the dead. And what does he say right after he comes back from the dead? He says, Peace be unto you, verse 21 of chapter 20. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. It's everywhere. And then in, in Acts 1, which we didn't read a moment ago, just before he ascends to heaven, his final words on the planet, before he ascends up out of sight and the two angels there make their comments, he says that you're going to receive power once the Holy Spirit comes upon you so that you can be witnesses unto me in all the world. Same purpose all the way through. What a great thing that is. You know, because you wonder, uh, you know, if you don't have purpose in your life, then your life doesn't have meaning. And to have meaning in your life, you have to have purpose no matter what it might be. But obviously, to discover what God's purpose is for your life is to give real meaning to your life. You know, we have a purpose. We're left here for a reason. And we're not left here to make this world a better place to go to hell from. We're left here to rescue all the people on this planet that are perishing. And uh, it's a wonderful privilege that we all have. We can all do it in different ways. And uh, we all obviously have different talents and different abilities and we can all in some way uh, fit into the program of accomplishing that. You know, even uh, for the church to operate, we need some people to make sure the air conditioning is on. Uh, every Sunday morning we have those that prepare the candles and get them ready and light them up. We have people that fold the bulletins, uh, people that uh, make sure the doors are unlocked. People that put the signs out the street for the parking of the cars that come in. People that greet people at the doors and others that are going to be teaching the children and get the nursery open and uh, all the other things that happen. There's lots of things that happen with different people doing different jobs just to make the thing go. And uh, as we come together then to worship and people bring their lost friends, we see people get saved. And everybody, I think, is a part of that and are part of the... Uh, reaping the rewards. I think this church is really unique in the sense that we have uh, really been given by God a worldwide ministry because we're really reaching people all over creation from this place. And I think everyone that prays and gives and is helping in any way is going to be sharing in all of that which happens all over the world. It's just absolutely an amazing thing. And uh, I think God is slowly opening up more opportunities for us. And that was a real blessing for me today when I talked to the people in Chattanooga and they uh, were telling me how much they appreciate the tracks that we have. They said, they really work. They really work. We've actually seen people get saved with those things. So they're pitching all the tracks they used to have at the station in Chattanooga. And then they said that... CD you sent us on, How Permanent Is Your Salvation, which we use as an evangelistic tool. <clears throat> this was about 11.30 this morning. And the uh, secretary in the office said, the manager, Trey, is playing that on the air right now. We'd just been on an hour that we'd paid for. And then between 11 and 12, he's playing the hour CD on How Permanent Is Your Salvation all over. That reaches northern Alabama, northern Georgia, and Tennessee. It's right there on the corner of those uh, states all coming together. And uh, not exciting. They said, we just love your program and we just love your teaching and uh, we 
are you know putting a lot of your stuff out there because we believe just like you do and we believe it's important to evangelize and the nice compliment was they said if you had a church up here in Chattanooga we would all be attending that was real sweet of them to say because they said we just enjoy hearing and learning from Bible line and this general manager up there said as he wrote me a letter a year ago that he got saved by hearing our program and uh, so now they're just growing and learning and it's been a wonderful experience but anyway this is a our purpose. Uh, so we have direction. What are we left here for? Is there a reason why God has left us here on the earth? My dad was a very practical man. And he said, if we don't have any purpose, then why doesn't God just take our lives as soon as we get saved? You get saved and boom, drop dead. You know, And he obviously leaves us here after we get saved because he has some purpose for us to accomplish. I said, that makes a lot of sense, Dad. And here is the purpose. When you read the Bible, it tells us that ultimately our purpose is that we're going to touch other lives on our way through this life. And hopefully we'll see uh, people uh, come to know Christ as their Savior. And, uh, you know, sometimes there are people that are seeking that are just ready, just absolutely ready. And uh, Chris just left, but we went to lunch Sunday after church. And uh, there was a 17-year-old waiter, and uh, I gave him a heaven track, and he really seemed to be interested. And he spoke Spanish and English, so we gave him one in each language. And he's checking the one off and checking it off in both languages. It was kind of interesting. And I was uh, not feeling that great, and I said, Chris, would you go through it with him, because I don't have the energy just explain it. Right there, he trusted the Lord. He said, can I get more of those? I want to give this to my mom. I know that she'll check off the very same ones I did. And he wanted to lead her to Christ. And uh, he said he's coming tomorrow night to prayer meeting. He says, I want to, I, my mom and I have been looking for a church. And uh, so he was hungry. He was ready. And uh, when we got back out of the car, Chris said it, was, said it was fruit ready to be picked. And I said, you're absolutely right. He was hungry, ready. And I knew it as soon as I had him that track and he was so responsive. He got his his little uh, pencil out or pen and started checking things off in two different languages on the two tracks. And I said, Chris, I don't have the energy. Would you explain it all to him? And boom, boom, boom. Uh, in a few minutes, he trusted the Lord as his Savior. It was wonderful. And uh, sometimes, you know, we don't have to do anything but just kind of shake the tree a little bit and the fruit falls off because, you know, that's when it's ripe, it's ready to go. And you just have to ask the Lord to let you bump into people that are seeking and are ready to be harvested. So I think it's a wonderful verse here. Jesus said, verse 21, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Now you say, well, this is the 12 apostles, and of course, uh, actually the uh, 11, because Judas, you know, betrayed the Lord, and then he went out and committed suicide. But uh, if you go back to John 17, um, for those that want to argue that and say, well, that's not for me. Uh, that's for just the apostles. Look, if you will, at verse 20. He just said in verse 18 of John 17, As thou hast sent me into the world, even have I also sent them into the world. But now look at verse 20. John here, I mean, Jesus says in verse 20, Neither pray I for these alone. That is, those that were in his presence, hearing his voice. But he says, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That extends it right down to today to every one of us that have heard the gospel from person to person to person, from generation to generation, right down to this hour. And I think the same goes for chapter uh, 20 here as well. And obviously in Acts, when Christ repeats it again, to everyone in this age uh, of uh, the church, from Pentecost to all the rapture, that receives the Holy Spirit, is empowered with that same purpose to be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, in Samaria, and up to the uttermost parts of the earth. So uh, obviously we have been given uh, that commission. And uh, some people just pass out tracts. And some people are shy. And I like to tell you that I can identify with that very much. And uh, some people I notice will take tracts 
They go in the grocery store. They look up and down the aisle to see that there's nobody on that aisle. And then they'll slip them a track between the green beans and the corn. And then they'll park down at the end of the aisle and look and see if anybody comes by and maybe finds that. Or they leave it in the restroom. Nobody's there. Leave it up on the counter. And then they come back later before they leave the store and sure enough it's gone. Somebody picked it up. Somebody went in to wash their hands and they found the track. And uh, a lot of people find a lot of uh, satisfaction in doing that because they know the tracks are being taken. They know they disappear and, and you can kind of leave them around and do it kind of secretly. After a while, I think the Lord brings you out of your secretness and you become more open. But start wherever you are. If you want to be a secret uh, track hider, uh, go ahead and do it that way. But whatever, it's a great opportunity. Now we have verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Now, in the Old Testament times, believers did not have the Holy Spirit. The prophets did, and different individuals were empowered for special uh, service by the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit would come and go and did not permanently indwell. So at this point, the disciples did not have the Holy Spirit. But here, he breathes on them the Holy Spirit, which I believe was a temporary indwelling that now stayed with them for the next 40 days while he taught them after he'd come back from the dead. I believe when Christ ascended, they didn't have the Holy Spirit anymore, and then they had to wait 10 days until the 50th day, until Pentecost, to receive the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit of this age. So, uh, I believe this is what's taking place here. He is now equipping these disciples and he gives them early, before Pentecost, the Holy Spirit for those 40 days to enable them to really drink in and take in <clears throat> what he was saying to them. To open up their understanding and to illuminate their understanding. So uh, the breathing on the disciples here of the Holy Spirit is they're receiving the Holy Spirit for empowerment for those 40 days only. But then the Holy Spirit left. And I believe they received the Holy Spirit permanently on the day of Pentecost. Then it says in verse 23, <clears throat> Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Now the Roman Catholic Church has taken that and has claimed that their priests have the power in the confessional booth to forgive your sin, to absolve you of your sins. So you go to confession and you confess your sins and the priest has the power supposedly to forgive them. That's not true. Now, <clears throat> every believer has this power, but it's not separate from the gospel. It's in the message that we bring to people, and when we tell them how they can be saved through Christ, we have the power to remit sins. In other words, when I tell somebody the gospel message and they believe it, I can tell them on the authority of God's word that their sins have been remitted or forgiven. If I talk to a person about the gospel and they reject the gospel, I can tell them on the authority of God's word that they are not remitted, that they are not forgiven, and that they will go to hell if they die without Christ. So we have that power in our message. Now, obviously, Peter was one of them. And if you just look at what the apostles said, we find that that is exactly what they said. Turn, if you will, to Acts 4.12, which you hear me recite a lot, so it shouldn't be an unfamiliar verse to you. But in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, Peter is saying, in verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other but us ordained, appointed apostles or priests, and we have the power to absolve your sins. No. Verse 12. Peter tells us, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He's talking about Jesus. In other words, you have to trust Christ if you want salvation. And there is no salvation in any other name than His. So we have the power of the message of the gospel. And when we bring that message to someone, we can bring them the forgiveness of their sin, or we can bring them uh, the message that condemns them if they reject it. 
Turn, if you will now, to Corinthians, and I think you'll find this interesting, as it's on the same line that we are uh, to be sharing this message. We're going to go now to uh, 2 Corinthians, and this will be uh, chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse... 14. Here Paul, the apostle, is discussing the same theme. Page 1231, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and maketh, please note verse 14 in the middle, maketh manifest or maketh known the savor of his knowledge by who or whom? Us in every place. Second Corinthians 2.14 Thanks be unto God which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest or maketh known the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. So the way God makes his knowledge known about Christ or the gospel is by us in every place in the world. God uses believers. Verse 15 says, We are unto God... At 2 Corinthians 2, 15, page 1231. We are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved. In them that perish, to the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. Wow. In other words, when we bring this message, we either bring life to the lost soul and they become saved, or we bring a message of condemnation because if they reject Christ, they're going to hell. Kind of scary, isn't it? We have the power uh, in the message that we bring to people. And so if you know somebody who's lost, you can bring life to them. But if they reject it and die without Christ, then they brought condemnation upon themselves. And our message has been one of death to that person. Look at it again. Verse 15. We are under God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish that is that they die without Christ to the one were the savor of death and the death and to the other were the savor of life and the life and who is sufficient for these things well obviously uh, uh, it's quite a responsibility and privilege that we all have and God has chosen uh, people just like you and me to do it so he makes manifest the knowledge about Christ in every place by us, who will take that message wherever we might go. And uh, that is exciting, uh, that we can be a part of that and uh, take that message around the world. And uh, if everyone here just shared it uh, with someone, you never know uh, where that might lead. You know... Uh, you never know who you might lead to Christ. Uh, what was interesting is the story about D.L. Moody is that he was just uh, a little boy and uh, went to get a little job as a, a guy working in a shoe store. And his uh, boss, who was a very shy witness, uh, got him aside as a little boy and led him to Christ. And that's the story of how he got started. And then he began to bring his friends to Sunday school and uh, they had so many kids coming to Sunday school, uh, they didn't know what to do. And D.L. Moody, the great evangelist, really was just a little boy, got led to Christ by a shoe salesman who didn't really, uh, uh, probably wouldn't have spoken to an adult, but spoke to a child and led D.L. Moody to Christ. And what a great uh, evangelist he turned out to be. And you never know who you might talk to, it might be a child, but they might become a great, for God and be used in a mighty way and you just never know uh, who you might share the gospel with or leave a track with. Uh, you'll never know. You'll just never know. And uh, how wonderful it is when uh, you share it and you know that God is going to bless His Word and that Word will go out and reach many others. We are uh, going to have to probably wind it up right here and we're going to come back next week and I believe we probably will be able to finish the book next week. And that'll be class 17 and 18. 
And that means that we'll probably divide the whole course up into part one, nine hours, and part two, nine hours, and um, so that people can get it in parts, I think, because it's a lengthy one. But I think this has been a good book and a good course, and we've tried to not uh, skimp on uh, or race the uh, last chapters here. So hopefully you've gotten something out of it. Hopefully you've learned some things tonight that you didn't know before. Hopefully you're challenged, as hopefully we always try to do. And I want to thank all of you watching on the Internet right now that are uh, sticking with us tonight. And also uh, those that will watch this uh, in the future on DVD or listen to the CDs that will be available later. Let's pray and we're going to depart tonight. Lord, we thank you again for your word, for the opportunity to come together to study it. We pray for this wonderful book, the Gospel of John. Pray that it might just really excite us and transform our our Christian lives so that we might become a part of the action uh, as uh, we're to take this word and, and make manifest this word in every place, wherever we go. We are a, a carrier. Uh, we can infect people uh, with the gospel and get people saved. And we pray we might be uh, someone who would be a carrier of the message and uh, never know who we might uh, reach as we do that. We ask you to bless now and bring us back safely next week. In Jesus' name, amen.